back during the Depression, a little boy asked his father if he could go to the traveling circus since he had never seen one before. And the boy had worked really hard that summer, so the dad decided that he would give the little boy a dollar so that he could go to the circus, more money than that boy had ever seen before. He ran into town in time to see the grand parade coming down the main street. There were the elephants and, and the lions and the dancers and the whole circus crew. He was thrilled to see that. And when the last clown danced down the street, the little boy handed him the dollar bill and he ran home. You see, he thought that he had seen the circus on the street, but all he saw was the prelude to the main event. I wonder, do we do that with worship as well? We sometimes think that since we attended an event on Sunday, sometimes called worship, a worship service, sometimes we think that we have worshiped. But what we probably did was forget that, that what we attended was merely a prelude for a lifestyle of authentic worship and praise that was to go on that entire week. This word worship has often been misused. It's an unfortunate confusion of what worship really is. We often hear words like worship band or worship music or the worship service starts at a certain time, maybe a worship uh, order. Sometimes we've even heard of worship wars, unfortunately. There are four things that I think are significant for us to really quick, quickly understand about worship, and it's what authentic worship is not. Authentic worship has very little to do with you. Should I say it again, Marcy? Authentic worship has very little to do with you. It has nothing to do with your wants and your likes. Don't leave me hanging. Somebody's got to keep amen in me because I've got some hard things to say really quick. True worship is not interested in whether you enjoy it or not. Right. Authentic worship is not concerned with you get it, getting a liver quiver. Do you understand that theological word? It's not concerned about you getting excited, a liver quiver, whether you get something out of it or not. It has nothing to do with, you, with making you feel good or meeting your needs. But also, authentic worship has very little to do with a place. You don't come to worship, you do worship. You come to a building, but being in a building doesn't make you worship, does it? Moses worshiped in the desert and on the mountain, and Israelites worshiped in a tent, and Mary and Joseph worshiped in a stinky old barn, and Peter and Paul worshiped in a jail cell. The reality is that we can call this building a sanctuary, but you can do anything in here that you can do in a jail cell, and vice versa. Authentic worship also has very little to do with music. Sorry, band. Authentic worship is not about choirs. It's not about guitars. It's not about uh, drums. It's not about sound level. It's not about slides and lights and hymns and choruses. Now, I'll have to say that God loves a good conga solo every once in a while. <laughs> but it's not all about musical instruments or music. And authentic worship has very little to do with time. Worship is not just a scheduled event once a week, is it? Worship is not something that can be boxed and scheduled in a one and a half hour Sunday morning event. It has everything to do with every single event and moment of the day. Your board and I have been talking about what's important to us. Authentic worship 
is one of those core values that we knew had to be part of our identity. Would you help me to read this core value? Authentic worship. We believe, read it with me, we believe that because our holy God is worthy of our unconditional praise, he deserves our absolute best to honor him in every aspect of our lives. As you and I read through the Old Testament, especially there were times that God's people had a truly amazing worship experience. Just stand with Moses at the burning bush and God shows up. I just can't imagine that scene. Later on, Moses is on the mountaintop, Mount Moriah, and he's in the presence of God and God gives him the laws, the commandments. It wasn't just 10 commandments God told him, right? There, there were all of the other laws that we see in Leviticus. It was just an amazing worship experience, so, so grand that the, the Israelites had to back away from the mountain so that they wouldn't die. God's presence was so real. The Israelites meeting with God and watching him lead them through the desert with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of of fire by night, how amazing of a worship experience that would have been. And then Abraham being visited by the Lord himself and two other angels as they tell him that he's going to be a father at age 99 and Sarah just laughs. But what a wonderful worship experience that would have been. But one of my favorite worship moments is in Isaiah chapter 6 that I spoke of earlier when Isaiah is ushered into the very presence of God and his divine presence moves Isaiah to worship the Lord with authenticity and it leads to introspection and finally to action. I want us to recognize that authentic worship is God focused. Authentic worship is not focused on us. It's focused on God. The scripture says in Isaiah chapter 6, In the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on, the, on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two wings they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling one to the other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Can you imagine that scene? Authentic worship happens when God shows up. Isaiah was in the very presence of God himself. The only way that he could explain this was that he said God's, the train of God's robe filled the temple. And I don't even know what that looks like, but basically God's presence was so palpable, so real. It was wall to wall. It was ceiling to floor. God's presence was just radical there. And then he talks about the seraphs. Now, a seraph was an angel, but he was the commander of the Lord's army. Can you imagine the awesomeness of that? God's commanders of his army had six wings, and with two they covered their face, and two they covered their feet, and two uh, wings they were flying, and they were calling one to the other. Even God's angels felt undone in the presence of God. Can you imagine that? The commanders of God's army felt undone. There was this, there was fire and smoke and the earth was shaking. There was a cacophony of singing and praising back and forth as these angels were celebrating God. It was just a wonderful celebration of the presence of God. Authentic worship recognizes God's divine holiness. 
I have to just imagine how Isaiah felt as he was in the presence of God trying to grasp the grandeur, the divine, the depth of holiness, the purity, the awesome power, the wisdom. Listen, God himself had shown up in that sanctuary. I, I, can, can you even imagine that? Adam Clark was a, 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 a theologian of the early 1900s and uh, he tried his best to define God. Now, he's a theologian. He knew he couldn't, but you have to try, right? And I've read this so many times, and I just so appreciate Dr. Clark's trying. But at the end, he really gets down to it, and he realizes he can't do it. But this is what he said. This is how he tried to define God. He said the eternal, independent, and self-existent being, the being whose purpose and actions spring from himself without foreign motive or influence, he who is absolute in dominion, the most pure, the most simple, the most spiritual of all essences, infinitely perfect and eternally self-sufficient, needing nothing that he has made illimitable in his immensity, inconceivable in his mode of existence and indescribable in his essence, known fully only by himself because an infinite mind can only be fully comprehended by itself. In a word, a being who from his infinite wisdom cannot err or, or be deceived and from his infinite goodness can do nothing but what is eternally just and right and kind. My mind just explodes whenever I see this. At, uh, uh, Dr. Clark is trying his best to wrap his arms around who God is and the beauty of his righteousness and divinity and pureness, right? But he can't do it. Authentic worship also has nothing to do with what we want. Notice the focus of this scene. Isaiah saw the Lord seated on his throne, high and exalted, and the seraphs were crying out, holy, holy, holy to God, and the building shook, and it was filled with smoke. It had been a very, it must have been a very uncomfortable scene for Isaiah, if you can imagine and we often have a total misunderstanding of worship. I've heard sometimes people say, well, I, I didn't get anything out of it. <laughs> As a pastor, there are some things that I want to say when I hear something like that. Can I ask you, in this passage, did... Do you think that the seraph said to Isaiah, Isaiah, is, are we too loud for you? Are you uncomfortable? We want to make you comfortable in God's presence. Is it too much, Isaiah? Was the sermon of God too long? Did God's presence make you uncomfortable? Sorry about that. Did, did we... Did we get you out of this worship experience so that you could beat the Baptist to the buffet? I don't think that the seraph said that to Isaiah. God didn't say, Isaiah, is my purity too much for you? I, I don't want you to feel too sinful. What if Isaiah would have said, well, it was just too loud for me. I just didn't care for that music. The, what was coming out of the speaker system, gosh, that was way too much. I didn't like the music, too many drums, too long of a service. Worship, my friends, is not about you. It's all about God. It's all about God. Can I also tell you that authentic worship convicts us? Woe to me, Isaiah said. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. 
and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Authentic worship makes us realize how undone we are. There's a Hebrew word that is often found in the pro uh, prophetic writings, both the, the major and the minor uh, prophets. It's the word, the phrase, woe is me. Woe is me. Isaiah actually says it six times, and it's a Hebraic uh, uh, phrase that basically is a death cry. <clears throat> Whenever you see woe in the prophetic books, particularly in the book of Isaiah where it's really seen over and over, it's this, it's this recognition that I am about to die with what I am, the presence of God that I am in. I just cannot bear living. Woe is me. That's what Isaiah was saying. And when Isaiah saw God, what does he do? Whoa! It's not the woe of today. Whoa, man. That's not what he was saying. He was saying death. Oh, I'm about to die because God's presence is so pure, so holy. I'm about to die in his presence. Woe is me. Isaiah looked at God's righteousness and saw his own wickedness. Isaiah looked at God's holiness and saw his own wretchedness. Listen, you can't come into the presence of God and be arrogant. You can't be conceited. You can't be proud and puffed up or stuck up. The text implies that he really didn't realize how messed up he really was until he came into the very presence of a holy God. We also realize when we're in God's presence how undone the world is. Experiencing God's holiness puts our world in context really quickly, doesn't it? We begin to see how broken politics are, how broken entertainment is. We see sin and we're sickened by it because we see it against God's holiness. There have been times when I've been in the presence of God as Darla and I have been worshiping with music going on and we've been praying and then we turn the TV on and we're like, ah, ew, oh, ah, right? There's just this dichotomy between what is holy and what is not holy. When you're in the presence of God, it creates a, a recognition of how pure God is and what he wants of the world. And then we begin to look at the world and we see brokenness and we see sin and we see addictions. We realize how holy and pure God is when we're in his presence. I'm going to say something that won't shock you. Darla is the color queen of our house. Yeah. Now, uh, she will send me <clears throat> to the paint store to get yellow paint or whatever it is. Now, in my mind, men, there are only three colors of yellow. There's bright yellow, mid yellow, and light yellow. She thinks they're like 45 shades of yellow. And she could probably quote 45 shades in alphabetical order. That's how her mind works. I, I don't understand it. But there have been times that I have been sent to the, the store to match a certain white. <laughs> Did you know there's more than one white? <laughs> how is that? White is white, right? But I'll take my white to the, the color matcher and I compare it with white, white, bright, white, white. And mine looks like a brown, dingy, whitish. But when I put it to a pure, bright white, it's radically different. Isaiah just doesn't recognize how holy 
God is until he stands in God's presence. He also doesn't realize how sinful and broken and needy and disturbed and desperate he is until he is in the very presence of God. Authentic worship transforms us. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, Isaiah says, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Can I tell you that authentic worship is costly? Authentic worship costs a lot. You see, worship begins with confession. Isaiah says in 5, I am ruined. I, I am broken. I, I can't bear myself whenever I'm in your presence, God. And he begins to confess. He said, I am a man of unclean lips. What if we said, when we begin to enter worship, maybe it's before we come into the church building, maybe it's right when we sit down on our couch and we are about to spend time studying God's word and worship. What if before we turn the radio on and we know that one worship song is going to come on and we desperately need God's presence, what if we first said, oh God, I am desperate for you. Oh, Father, I have come short of your glory, and I desperately need your presence. What if we said, I am in need of you. I want you in where I am. I want to be where you are. You are welcome to cleanse me, Father. What if we did that? How would that change the way that we worshiped? How would that change our uh, our perspective before we came through these doors and came to this place, it would radically change what we expect the worship service to be. It will no longer be what I can get or is Marcy going to play the song that I want or it's too high for me or the drums are too loud. It would then become, Lord, I want to be in your presence. I want to give to you honor and praise and authentically worship you. It becomes God-focused instead of me-focused. Worship demands our absolute best, friends costly. The entire book of Leviticus makes clear that we give our best to God because God is holy. Because God is holy. In fact, if it, just do a real quick skim of Leviticus right after your Nazarene nap this afternoon. Just skim uh, Leviticus and look at the very last sentence of most of the sections. They are to do certain things. Why? Because God is holy. They are to not to deal with certain molds in their houses. Why? Because God is holy. They are to, to do certain things with the cleanliness of their homes. Why? Because God is holy. They are to treat their bodies a certain way. Why? Because God is holy. David says he will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord that costs him nothing. Wow, what does that say to how we give ourselves to service? How, do we, how we give ourselves to worship? How we give our first and our best to God in our tithes and our offerings? David says, I'm not going to tip God. I'm, it's going to cost me. I, I'm going to give God my absolute best. I'm not going to wait until I've done all of my tasks and then if I've got a few minutes to give back to God. That's not what David says. He says, listen, my sacrifice, I am not going to give something that costs me nothing. It's going to cost me everything. God is worth that. 
Authentic worship also demands a response. Isaiah says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. Authentic worship means life change. What was the response of the Bible characters when they authentically worshiped God? Well, Abraham, when he worshiped, he made a covenant with God. Moses, when he authentically worshiped, he took his shoes off because he was in the presence of a holy God. What did David do? Well, he danced and he worshiped. <laughs> what did Solomon do when he authentically worshiped? He he gave his life to building a temple to honor God. The Magi gave expensive gifts and Mary and Joseph trusted. And Peter walked on the water and Stephen witnessed and Paul worshiped God in prison. Let me ask you, after you worship God in your personal devotions, what is your response how are you changed? How are you different? Do you expect God to use you because you were in the presence of God? Now let's make this personal. Farrell on church. What does a core value like authentic worship mean to Farrell on Church of the Nazarene? First of all, it's this. We recognize that authentic worship is a powerful weapon against the enemy. Isn't that true, church? We recognize that authentic worship is a powerful weapon against the enemy. Can I remind you that the enemy despises our worship and prays to God so much that he can't even be in the presence of anyone who is actively worshiping and praising God. Amen. He can't stand the praises of his saints. He can't stand to be in a place when we're lifting our hands and honoring God and turning on our praise music and we are worshiping him. So what do we do, church, whenever we need to flee from the enemy? What do we do but we worship God? What do we do whenever we are tempted, we, we begin to praise it's the greatest weapon ever against temptation? What do we do, church, when we're exhausted and spiritually depleted? Satan loves to use those times when we're sick and exhausted or depressed. What do we do? We begin to praise God. We begin to sing and we begin, we begin to recount the names of God, all that we can remember. Just begin to remind God who he is in our lives. It's a powerful weapon. What do we do when we, we are fearful, when we're anxious, when we need resources and we are in fear that we might not have what it takes, we begin to worship. And it's the most powerful weapon known to God's people to remove ourselves from the presence of the enemy. Amen? Amen. Second, it, we recognize that authentic worship is costly and it requires a sacrifice. When we worship God, we lay down whatever consumes us and we become consumed with him. Authentic worship takes the focus off of ourselves. And it puts our focus entirely on God. We fully recognize that Jesus, we fully recognize Jesus as our everything. And we begin to praise him for everything that he has done. We worship him for his blood sacrifice on the cross for us. We praise the Father for his love that he demonstrated to us that he willingly laid down his, his, his own life that we might live for him, with him forever. We praise him for his forgiveness, 
of all of our sins because we were once separated from him, but now we have fellowship with him. We praise him for the gift of life he secured for us, and we worship him as our God. We worship him as our Lord, our Savior, our Deliverer, our Healer, our Provider, our Protector, and so much more, church. When we're in God's presence, it costs everything. And we believe that authentic worship is the simplest form of prayer. Do you ever recognize that? Worship is the simplest form of prayer. There have been new believers that have come to me and said, well, pastor, I don't know how to pray. Let me show you a really good prayer. There's no words sometimes when I worship. There's sometimes I, I don't know what to say. But all I can do is just be in the presence of God and just soak in his, and just lift God high. Let somebody else sing. Let somebody else give the conga solo. I'm just worshiping God. Worship is the simplest form of prayer. Paul told the Ephesians to walk wisely because the days were evil and they needed to always understand the will of God, was, uh, what God's will was for them. Doesn't that sound like today, right now? I turn on the news as you guys do and I just shake my head. What in the world are they thinking? Anybody shake your head when you listen to the news? <laughs> just like... I can't believe they're making that law. I can't believe that they're saying that a man can now birth a baby. I don't understand that. I don't get it. But Paul says, just to us as he did the Ephesians, walk wisely because the days were evil and they needed to always understand what the will of God was for them. Paul told them, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another, listen, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. How do you know the will of God? Start by singing praises and hymns and melodies before God. And God begins to speak to us. Praise is prayer. Prayer is praise, right? It's the same. It's honoring God with our words and with our actions and with our, with our time. Paul used an interesting word for be filled. It was a word that meant to continuously fill. It, it means that we need to be filled afresh with more of what God has for us. How does that happen? With a constant refreshing of worship and prayer. That's how God refreshes us. That's how God fills us. When we are filled afresh each day with the Holy Spirit, our worship never runs dry. Never. We are constantly refreshed and filled by the Holy Spirit. And through that, he gives us wisdom because the days are evil. And the last is this. We know that when we authentically worship God, he inhabits the praises of his people. He inhabits our praises. Did you know that when you worship God, his presence comes to be with you in greater power. No wonder the enemy can't stay around. Because when we worship, God's presence comes. And his Holy Spirit infills. And he gives us wisdom. And our minds are turned towards God. And it's not turned towards what the enemy has to say to us. Paul says, the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 
Isn't that the best news? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. It means in the presence of the Holy Spirit, we are liberated. The Holy Spirit waits for your invitation to manifest in greater ways in your life. Your worship is an invitation of the Holy Spirit to do his work in you. When we invite him, he comes to live in you in greater measure. So let me end by saying this about authentic worship. When we right here at Fairlawn Church of the Nazarene say that authentic worship is one of our core values, then what we are doing is we are inviting the Holy Spirit to take full control of our ministries. It, authentic worship, it makes the enemy flee from us. It breaks down the chains of addictions. Authentic worship spawns a life of confession and submission. Authentic, work, uh, authentic worship puts in perspective the gravity of the salvation story that we've been given to share to others. Authentic worship causes a sacrificial response that costs a whole lot. Authentic worship makes us want to give our best and give our most and give our first to him. Authentic worship, it's the act by which we are clothed with the armor of God. It is the simplest form of prayer, authentic worship. It forces us to step aside and give God his rightful place he is our creator, my friends. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He is our Redeemer, our Healer, our Provider, the Lamb of God. He is our Messiah, our Peace Giver, the Righteousness, the God who sees, the Anointed One, the Father, Everlasting God. He's my Shepherd, your Shepherd, the Lord God Almighty. That's what happens when we authentically worship we let God be exactly who he wants to be in our lives. Yeah. Authentic worship. We believe that because our holy God is worthy of our unconditional praise, he deserves our absolute best to honor him in every aspect of our lives. Would you please stand? We're going to end our service a little bit different than what we normally do. I want you to listen to a few minutes of, I believe, the most anointed sermon that I have ever listened to in my life, and I've listened to 12 or 14 sermons. I've listened to a lot. It's from a pastor by the name of S.M. Lockridge, Interestingly enough, SM stands for Shadrach Meshach. I love that. Pastor Lockridge preached a sermon called He's My King back in 1970 at the Woodville Baptist Church. I think you will quickly see why this sermon has survived at least 50 years of proclamation. In this, the ending of this sermon Pastor Lockridge tries to define God, and he realizes that he can't. It's a holy moment, and I want to leave us with authentic worship in our minds, and can I just ask, I've had you stand for this. You're going to watch some slides, but would you take this as an opportunity to worship God as Pastor Lockridge is doing his best to define God? This is going to be a wonderful opportunity for us to express, uh, express our worship to him, Pastor Lockridge.
my king, hallelujah. That's my king. <laughs> my benediction this morning can be nothing less than the scene that John the Revelator provides in his chapter 5 of Revelation when the angels and those redeemed have an authentic worship experience. Would you listen to his revelation in chapter 5? And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open the seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a king and priest to serve our God and they will reign on earth. Then I, John, looked and heard the voices of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousands times ten thousand. They encircle the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice they were crying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the seas and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and forever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and they worshiped him. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Go in peace, for he's already gone before you. You're dismissed.